pictures familiar at a glance. Roy Lichtenstein. He was set on entering art history. Well, all artists are. But some know their limits, others don't have that ambition. But he was incredibly ambitious. In a way, he wanted to be an American Picasso. An American artist who wanted to write his name in the history of art. The first stage of his life he spent as a father, who to provide for his family did odd jobs. He was a teacher, a graphic designer. He spent longer in search of himself than actually being Liechtenstein. Famous the world over for his works of parody portraying American culture, he was a reflection of his era, the inventor of a new artistic movement. In the 60s, he was a bit like a UFO, someone who pushed the boundaries. The head honcho of pop art was the son of a simple, ordinary family, the opposite of his alter ego, the superstar Andy Warhol. While Andy Warhol's wigs and outfits wowed the world, Liechtenstein didn't wear anything special. He wasn't seen. We didn't even really know his face. In order to understand the ambition and production secrets of one of the most inventive artists of his generation, we must look past the artist's discretion and the apparent frivolity of his work. I think we became kindred spirits in many ways. We knew that if you wanted to do something well, you had to do it over and over and over again. And repetition was something that was in our blood. So when we were working, we would kid each other about you know, how many times do we have to do this to get it right? But uh, 10 is better than one, you know, that sort of thing. It was his closest collaborators who knew the true Roy Lichtenstein. Those who rubbed shoulders with him every day in New York. Behind an apparently simple painting, there was a meticulous painter, a workaholic who never left his studio. Roy walked in the studio in Southampton that morning, and after saying, hello, how are you? He said, today would be a good day to photograph. And um, I thought, huh, he's never said that before. There, there are wonderful moments that I'm glad that I was there for. His studio was in the Hamptons, a few kilometers from New York. A bubble of isolation where the artist took refuge to paint relentlessly. His wife keeps the studio as it was. Exceptionally, she's opened the doors to this private space where nothing has been moved in 16 years. Easel that he invented is, again, this rotating easel. Um, and again, it's adjustable. Um, Roy, when he worked, especially when he did a very strong image, he liked to work on it. Uh, sideways and upside down. In order to, you know, kind of break the idea of just a picture of something, uh, he would rotate the canvas, but also uh, look in the mirror. Um, so that he got more distance from it. And I'm the only artist in the world, I think, who has no idea what he'd do making a movie. And I'm really only interested in painting, and I don't have any ideas about making, uh, or working in any other medium. Lichtenstein is a child of New York's affluent middle class. Born on the 27th of October 1923, he grew up in an upmarket part of Manhattan, the Upper West Side. His childhood was happy and privileged. His mother, a homemaker who indulged him. A talented pianist, sophisticated, she gave him a cultured polish. 
His father, a real estate broker, provided material comfort. The family was untouched by the Great Depression of 1929, which nonetheless devastated the United States. Roy was a happy, quiet child who loved his parents. Like all young Americans of that generation, he devoured comic books, which in the 1930s had their golden age. At 10 years old, his heroes were Flash Gordon, Superman, and Mandrake the Magician. Children mainly read. They didn't go to the cinema. They read comics. So, as he could afford them, he was certainly immersed in comics. He also visited museums with his mother. And we know from what he told us that he had his first big aesthetic shock in front of a Picasso piece. Young Roy wanted to be a painter. Art was not taught at his school, so his mother enrolled him in watercolour classes on Saturday afternoons. At the age of 13, he preferred painting to playing baseball with his friends. His new hero came from the other side of the Atlantic. He lived in France, like all the great painters, as is the fashion in the interwar years. This new mentor was Pablo Picasso. Today we underestimate the influence that the name Picasso embodied. He was the best known artist in the world, and probably the first artist in history to be in such a position. Roy was a teenager when Picasso was on the front cover of Time in 1939, the year in which the New York Museum of Modern Art showed Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. Roy joined the crowds to admire this masterpiece, which America had just acquired for a fortune. He dreamt of becoming an American Picasso. He is in the first generation of young Americans who can dream of being an artist without their family throwing their arms in the air and saying, curse you, son, I'm disinheriting you. The young man had no trouble persuading his parents. His secondary studies were to be devoted to his passion. He joined an art faculty. The student cut out pictures from catalogues by the great European artists that he admired and is so inspired by. This is what he painted in 1942 at the age of 19. A Degas-style pose, clear-cut ochre colors like Cezanne. Basically, an intelligent digest of modern European art from the early 20th century. It's difficult to imagine today that the artist responsible is Liechtenstein, who some years later would invent pop art. But in the meantime, his artistic studies were interrupted by America going to war. Called up to the US Army, he first drew illustrations for the Army magazine Stars and Stripes. The war had other surprises in store for him, and even a real opportunity to cross the Atlantic in search of his painting idols. In 1944, he found himself in a liberated Paris and took the opportunity to visit museums such as the Louvre. But in Paris, there was a monument which in his eyes was even bigger than the Eiffel Tower. Picasso, of course. It was his childhood dream to meet him. And there's that story where he goes up to Picasso's door, terrified, and he chickens out. He doesn't dare to knock on the door. He never has the chance to try again, because his father becomes very ill, and he is called back to the United States. He even says that his European experience was like a story that ended badly, that was unfinished, incomplete.
This sense of incompletion didn't stop the great Picasso from influencing the American artist 42 years his junior. Picasso gives this sort of permission to artists to be free, including, in particular, an unknown artist who we later come to know as Roy Lichtenstein. To work with dots, a typographic framework, things which are not within the traditions of great art. So this liberty, it's the freedom of Cubism, the freedom of Picasso in the interwar period, it's this permission to experiment with everything in every way. But after the war, Roy would spend time daring to experiment to find his style. Fifteen years before finally becoming Liechtenstein, Returning to the United States because of his father's illness and then death, he obtained his degree in 1946. At the age of 23, Roy wanted to make a living from his painting. He was living in this all-conquering America, which was turning its back on the war economy. The United States were the great victors. Society was changing. Young American couples could buy their own homes, buy nice cars. In this newborn consumer society, there was an atmosphere of optimism. The American way of life was up and running. Soon much of the planet would dream of following suit. Roy had nothing of the downcast artist about him. On the contrary, he led an orderly and sensible life, that of a good middle-class American. In the first stage of his life, he was a painter. He was also already doing engravings and sculptures. He was married with two children, so he was a father, who, to provide for his family, did odd jobs. He was a teacher, a graphic designer. He did odd jobs, which other artists often do when they haven't had their breakthrough. So he led quite a typical life. He lived first in Ohio, then moved closer to New York to teach in a school in New Jersey. Roy worked relentlessly on selling his canvases. His creativity hadn't stopped since his teenage years, but he was still searching for his style and increasingly referenced other painters. It was, of course, to the Cubists that he turned first. The influence of Picasso in his works can clearly be seen. And when he decided to tackle the great classics of American painting, like Washington crossing the Delaware, one of the legends of the revolution. His interpretation is thoroughly Cubist and Picasso-like in style. The American flag is simplified to an extreme. The perspective, the faces, the colors are no longer realist. At this point, his subject is American folklore, great American scenes, because it's familiar and accessible. It's well known, it's consensual. Not consensual as such, he doesn't have any enemies, but consensual in the sense that we recognize what it is. His style is a little cubist, a bit expressionist, abstract. He is searching for his style, his form. At the age of 29, Roy hadn't yet found his own style. But a closer look reveals that he had already found a mood. The president is a big character, figuratively speaking. His cocked hat floats above his head. And the sword seems to be made of wood, like that of a child. The painter treats typically American pictures with humor. And this will soon become his trademark. Why wasn't he famous at this point? Because other painters were doing it, because it wasn't something new. He hadn't invented it. His early style was recognizable, but obviously it wasn't selling or being exhibited much. 
No matter how many trips to New York Roy made to present his works to galleries, sales weren't taking off, and he had to carry on teaching. He might want to enter art history, but a highly innovative new art movement, which burst onto the scene in the early 50s, seemed to pass him by completely. Born out of abstract expressionism, it's called action painting. Figurative representations are over. The canvas no longer tells a story. What counts now is solely the movement of painting, an almost sacred act. The creation becomes completely spontaneous, drunk on itself. The grand priest of this action painting is Jackson Pollock. He becomes famous the world over. Life magazine asks, is he the greatest living painter? Post-war America establishes itself as a great power even in the art world, and European cubism grows old almost overnight. Roy is not in tune with this radical new departure. He's really not someone who is rebelling. And perhaps the spirit of the era didn't correspond to his underlying disposition. He is fundamentally peaceful, and he doesn't create to rebel, but to enter art history in a very peaceful manner. Roy did try his hand at this spontaneous painting, however. Big movements that go in all directions, vivid colors with just one goal, to shock the retina. But that didn't convince many people. Some years later, when he was finally enormously successful, he would poke fun in his canvases, which were full of irony, at artistic techniques and at the abstract expressionists. Roy was approaching 40. This rather anonymous art teacher could have given up, but he was still searching for himself, going from one style to another. From early 20th century modernism by the European painters he has adored since childhood, to Picasso's Cubism, and from the reinterpretation of American cultural symbols to his later, far more abstract works. However, by the start of the 60s, Roy was on the verge of revolutionizing modern art. He would find his inspiration in a universe which seems devoid of all artistic pretension, in his six-year-old son's comic books. He said to himself, I'm going to do it for my children, but at the same time, I will work. So he took this silly joke about Donald, who has caught his own tail, thinking that he's caught a big fish, and Mickey, who, well, it's something totally childish. Here is the result. Look, Mickey, his very first piece of pop art. This first cartoon piece, it's the first one showing a scene from a comic book. The story goes that he painted it because his son set him a challenge. Dad, I bet you can't paint as well as this artist. And actually his father got hold of the comic and reproduced this famous piece entitled, Look Mickey, I've hooked a big one. He loved it. He loved producing a piece that had absolutely no resemblance to abstract expressionism, with a very low art subject matter, very ordinary, very banal. He said himself that once this canvas was painted, he was a bit surprised, even dismayed, a bit paralyzed by his own work. He hung it on the wall, he waited a bit before painting something else, and then realized that he couldn't paint anything else. This piece suddenly took all the space and his earlier works no longer had any raison d'être. He went on to destroy them, and he continued along this route following this first step on the road. He carried on with cartoon drawings, but also he continued to represent existing objects, existing images, public images, printed images. With this piece, Roy has finally found his way, an indication that he is aware of it. At the same time, he produces another piece, this time a diptych showing a pedal bin. Not an insignificant choice. This piece shows the foot of a woman who's throwing something into the bin. 
She presses her foot on the pedal, the lid opens. We don't know what she throws in. It's a diptych, bin closed, bin open, with the foot opening it. It's obvious he's throwing his past into the bin and also past art history. So there is a phenomenon of distancing oneself from something, maybe from the weight of history and literally throwing it in the bin and starting from scratch and starting a new life. There's a sort of rebirth. He breaks away. He breaks away from himself, his past, his era, art history. At 38 years old, Roy finally becomes Liechtenstein. An artist is born. His style is inspired by a simplistic drawing style that he takes from ever-present images around him, those in comics, but also in adverts, an inexhaustible source of pictures, the language of an era. Most of the plastic solutions had already been experimented with by others. I think that more subtly, he understood that society was changing and that to carry on making paintings in the 60s that resemble the works of the 40s or 50s would be to miss out on the social, political and economic changes that were transforming the United States at that time. Hey, Mom. Yes, you. Why fuss and fret about dinner? Why not have it right here? Yes, this drive-in offers everyone in the family a real picnic treat for dinner. We've got delicious sandwiches with all the trimmings and your other dinner favorites, plus whatever you want to drink, hot or cold. Come early before the show starts, or eat while you're being entertained. Since the war, there had been a plethora of publications, an astounding spread of all these things that make life a bit more cheerful for the housewife and so on. Here is a country proud of its industry, of its innovation, its wealth of invention. So all these new household goods, the vacuum cleaners, bins that open themselves when you put your foot down, all these things are the manifestation of a thriving culture, full of wonder at what they can get. Just as in the period when he was a young art student, he continues to cut out his sources of inspiration to stick them in notebooks. Haphazardly, he mixes drawings from adverts cut from directories or magazines with scenes he finds amusing in comics. He copies the subject onto a canvas, cropping it, simplifying the composition to transform it into a piece signed by Liechtenstein. What's interesting is that the subject already, the fact that he doesn't invent an image but copies an existing image, the fact that this image originates from a comic somehow seems secondary, a bit remote, whether it's from a comic published in comic style with strong colours, primary colours, or whether it's black and white, the objects portrayed in black and white in the black and white magazines. The idea is to represent the object in the style in which it appears, and in a way it's this movement towards today's world, the contemporary world, which will turn him from a classical painter to what we now call pop art. But at the time it was ordinary object art, an art that concerns itself with the banality of the contemporary world. Before he can achieve success, it remains for Roy to cross paths with one of the most famous New York gallery owners, Leo Castelli. Roy knocks on his gallery door with his first pop paintings. For the gallery owner, it's love at first sight, and he decides to take him on. By historic chance, at the same time, another painter shows him canvases also inspired by comics. An as yet unknown publicist, his name is Andy Warhol. Castelli assesses his work as less accomplished than Liechtenstein's. Andy Warhol must find something else. Art critic Anne Hindry remembers that 20 years later, gallery owner Leo Castelli always talked about it with emotion when she interviewed him in the 80s. Uh, he came to the gallery uh, with a number of paintings figuratively speaking, under his arm. We were very surprised at what he showed us. 
Liechtenstein arrived. He said it was extraordinary. I didn't know what to say, what to do. I was speechless. And I said to myself, I absolutely must take him on, knowing that if I did, I couldn't take on Warhol because they were too similar. Uh, and I liked it very, very much. We were a bit uh, surprised, but both of us immediately uh, thought that he was very good uh, and that we should take him on. To launch the career of his new protégé, Leo Caselli thinks big. He organizes an exhibition to which all of New York is invited. The shockwave is therefore considerable. All the canvases are sold on the first day, an incredible success. Frederick Tutin, who would later become friends with Liechtenstein, remembers February 1962 and the Liechtenstein exhibition. Some of the young people were crazy for it. I was. I thought, I've never seen anything like this. It's another way of thinking about art that we didn't know before, which was which is what really great art does to you. It changes your perception. It makes you think completely differently about what you've been seeing all the time. The first exhibit had been an absolutely phenomenal success and had an enormous impact because part of the success was also the negative reactions. So there was also a terrible outcry. The abstract expressionists, for example, had no interest in it. The great master, the two great masters of expressionism, Rosenberg and Greenberg, said, Greenberg said it would be forgotten in a year's time. Live magazine headlines, is he the worst artist in the US? Echoing the article devoted to Pollock a few years earlier, Liechtenstein's work is shown with before and after, this is how he began, and this is how he does it. In fact, the article is rather flattering, but from now on, Liechtenstein, both a popular and controversial artist, leaves no one unmoved. The uh, older generation were basically in uh, despair and anguish and angry. They thought it was a joke. The negative things was, this is an art in praise of commerciality. That would be something like for Warhol, you know, soup cans. Or they just praise capitalism. And the other thing would be this is a satire on capitalism. It, but, but it was nothing to do with that. Much more than all that, Liechtenstein has invented a new artistic syntax. Thick black lines do outline the shape and the use of the three primary colors, blue, red, and yellow, but most importantly, the small dots. Roy Lichtenstein was inspired by industrial printing characters used in the cheap newspapers of the time. Rather than using solid color, the printer uses dots in order to save ink. It uses less ink, so it really is economical. It's for financial reasons, and Liechtenstein explained that. There is a sort of logical and economical reason that these lines interest him, because they also imply a sort of vision of the world. It's the world of industry, commerce and advertising, which is conveyed in these dots. He will represent them and at the same time represent the society behind them, which is one of consumerism, capitalism, which aims for efficiency and which also seeks to make money from pictures. So they appear for that reason and they will stay, because these dots will also provide him with an identity. It becomes his style. It appropriates them along with the black lines, the three primary colors, as a part of his work. And one way or another, he will keep them for his whole life. With this graphical language, he can get started on new subjects. After the tearful comic book women, a period which lasts only three years, Roy Lichtenstein will finally tackle his main interest, art history. He starts by revisiting his favorite classics, like Matisse and his Goldfish, or the painter Fernand Léger, Mondrian, to whom he gives the Liechtenstein treatment with the playful motif of his little dots. 
The pictorial tradition behind it all, he sort of takes its legacy, he takes charge of it and reworks it, while keeping in mind these great painters, and he continually faces up to his favourite painters. But his most recurring preferred subject is very obviously Picasso. He frequently pays tribute to him, and in a sort of symmetry, he's clearly inspired by Picasso's ties with the great masters. Picasso enters into a dialogue with the historical masters, but he reinvents them, he transforms them, he mocks them at times, and that is something that Liechtenstein understood particularly well, and it's something he took up on his own account. So you see Liechtenstein's in the 60s, early on from the 60s, which are in fact copies of a Picasso that is anchored in a Delacroix painting in the style of Liechtenstein. So in the studio there are not two but three painters. There's Delacroix, Picasso and there's the young Liechtenstein who is discussing with the two others who are quite impressive participants. Liechtenstein had fun with artistic styles and movements. With this series, Bulls, painted in the style of Picasso, he goes from a realist study to an abstract canvas in the style of Theo van Duisburg in several steps, but always with his trademark. The black contours, the primary colours and the hatching. Roy Liechtenstein seems able to transform any art into a Liechtenstein. Here is how he winks at his old rivals, the abstract expressionists. He caricatures their brushstrokes on the canvas. If I was to extract a series, to showcase it more, it would perhaps be the brushstrokes, because that imagery of the brushstroke is what his work sets itself against. The work comes right on the tail of abstract expressionism, which was a very spontaneous art in principle, very spontaneous with big brush marks thrown by the painter at the canvas. And Liechtenstein, who is completely removed from that, who works slowly and precisely with his small dots, he paints brushstrokes. I find that very strong as a reversal. At the retrospective exhibit devoted to Roy Liechtenstein at the Pompidou Centre, there is the pleasure of seeing the icons of a painter who until now has had little exposure in France. But behind the works of pop art, the passion of reinterpreting art history strikes the visitor. It's present through the painter's entire career. It's at the heart of his work and particularly obvious in his Artist Studio series. On the same canvas, Liechtenstein mixes different movements, different artists. Hanging on the wall are the abstract pieces. And as a homage to Matisse, fruit is arranged on the floor. He even includes his preceding paintings as if he's quoting himself. Thus, Luke Mickey enters art history and joins his great masters. In this retrospective, the real discovery is the continual creativity of this artist, even beyond painting, when he becomes a sculptor. He brings his patterns to life for a sort of two-dimensional sculpture. This allows him particularly to represent the invisible, like with this series of mirrors and their reflections. Or with a cup of tea, he sculpts the escaping heat, invisible to the naked eye. It's his obsession with form in particular that struck the exhibit commissioner, who worked for several years to complete this retrospective. I finally understood why everyone recognized these images, why everyone knows his name, why today he is such a famous and favorite artist, because he took hours to place his lines. It is obvious how he moved little bits of paper, moved the colors, going from red, then preferring white, choosing words and faces as well. It's an enormous formal job. And he says of himself, what I do, it's form. There's another revelation which emerges when in front of an original canvas rather than just a copy in a book. The revelation comes when getting close to the paintings, scrutinizing the details. No apparent traces of a brush, no thickness to the paint. The work of an artist has never seemed so mechanical. What is this painter's trade secret, where so much energy is spent in getting rid of all traces of his involvement? 
Liechtenstein, a tireless creator, signed more than 4,500 canvases and sculptures, a signature that's known the world over, while he remained incredibly secretive, hidden behind his work. I interviewed him in New York in the 90s. Obviously, I knew roughly what he looked like, but I was nevertheless surprised by the physical appearance of the man who opened the door to me. Obviously, if I had gone to Warhol's, well, he was dead by then, but I wouldn't have been surprised by anything because I felt like everyone that I'd seen him hundreds of times, not Liechtenstein. He didn't play. He wasn't the type. It wasn't how he behaved. He's the artist that hides behind his work and doesn't become a sort of promotional tool for his work. For him, it was enough to hang pictures, to install sculptures, being sure that they are enough on their own and they will do the work on his behalf. One of the few film directors to have been able to film in action was a Frenchman. André S. Labart, director of the cult series Filmmakers of Our Time, made a film about him, which was made in his studio in the 70s and again in the late 80s. The first little studio where I saw Liechtenstein, on Long Island. He had his house, his studio at the end of the garden. It felt very much like a family environment. I wondered why he had such a big studio. And gradually I understood. He has 10 easels with paintings in progress. And that fascinated me. The studio, a sort of trapper's shack, still under construction. On Friday, the 29th of September, 1972, Liechtenstein was working there on a series of still life paintings. He was not yet 49 years old. The artist, we imagine him in overalls, paint stains everywhere. Not him. He paints very tidily. At that moment, I said to myself, he doesn't like painting in the sense where painting is something messy. He turns it around, crosses that, and he creates a completely clean painting. I have the impression that if he had a way, using modern methods to inject color and so on, without touching any paint, he would do so. To understand this clean gentleman painter, this artist who was so productive and so immaculate, we clearly have to go beyond the framework of his paintings and follow in his footsteps across the Atlantic to New York. Who was the mysterious man behind these extremely famous paintings? This painter who worked obsessively on removing all apparent traces of his presence. How does one produce a Liechtenstein? To reveal part of this enigma, his close friends, those who rubbed shoulders with him, those who worked the closest with him must be tracked down. Those who shared all his trade secrets. In the 60s, a successful Roy stopped teaching. He was able to devote himself to painting. He separated from Isabel, the mother of his children, and left to set himself up in the Hamptons with Dorothy, his new partner. Near the ocean, he sought out the quiet in his studio he built in the garden, his own bubble of isolation. Dorothy and Roy met in 64. The woman he spent the rest of his life with has exceptionally invited us into his studio, a sacred place which hasn't changed since the painter left it 16 years ago. These are just various things that came in the mail over, um, I mean, of course, there's Roy, Roy with our cat. <laughs> Um, our staff getting dressed up in Halloween costumes. <laughs> um, a lot of this has come up from Roy's, uh, during Roy's life, and then some other things are things that we've just, have come in the mail and we've, we've put them up here. He would have his painting, his paint set up like this, 
We really essentially left everything just about if a sculpture has to be painted, uh, it's usually only a sculpture. Uh, if it's damaged or yeah. we, there were a series and they weren't all painted, he still will come in here and uh, the archive in New York. So when Roy worked, he had paper printed because it was very tedious to put an area of dots or later on stripes and have to remove it if he decided he didn't want it. And so he started collaging pieces of, uh, you can see is a kind of typical Long Island salt box. And this is something he always built, this kind of easel on his wall. Um, and so you can actually have a very small painting, you know, here. This doesn't happen when he's working. Um, or you can push everything out of the way and have, you know, quite a large canvas. But he was always thinking of systems to make uh, life easier. To deal with his obsession with form, Roy Lichtenstein put in place a well thought out systematic method. Behind the mechanical appearance of his paintings, there's a tremendous amount of background work, of preparatory work, which is done by hand. Each canvas begins with a detailed sketch. An example is one of his artist studio paintings. His preparatory drawing is a sort of source picture for the painting. Roy Lichtenstein composes it, draws, makes collages, especially when defining the areas of solid colors, the dots, the lines. The picture is then projected onto a large canvas. He then traces the outlines in black, then the colors, but quite quickly, he looks to distance himself from the subject of the painting. Roy, when he worked, especially when he did a very strong image, he liked to work on it uh, sideways and upside down so that, as he said, uh, he wasn't just painting a picture of something. I mean, he was trying to make it work as a formal uh, work. And so in order to, you know, kind of break the idea of just a picture of something, uh, he would rotate the canvas, but also uh, look in the mirror uh, so that he got more distance from it. In this way, he can lose the pattern, forget it. For example, here he no longer feels like he is painting a woman's face. It's just a shape. His work, therefore, becomes a sort of abstraction with no reference to the original image. Roy Lichtenstein is very demanding. Before starting to paint, he spends a vast amount of time preparing his canvas. Without a doubt, this is where his trade secret lies. In any case, this is what his old collaborators like Laurie think. She worked alongside him every day at the start of the 90s. She has unforgettable memories from this collaboration. He would work with an opaque projector where he would put the tracing paper that had the drawing on it and um, he would project it against the freshly prepared canvas, the blank white canvas, and um, he would start to trace the proportions and um, the details of the painting. But then he would go back in freehand and reshape and redefine um, the details of the painting. And then the, these colored papers would be cut and Roy would work as if the a canvas was a collage and he would tape um, these different cutouts, shapes and different colors to how the painting would look and bit by bit as he would work on the painting different areas would be pulled away after he made the decisive choice of what color or what pattern um, he would work with. Roy spent a lot of effort 
making the painting look like it was machine made. Most of the paintings we know, um, his hand was defied and it looked really industrial. To make his handcrafted work appear as industrial as possible, Roy Lichtenstein continually tried out new techniques. He worked tirelessly from morning till night in his studio, seven days a week. This in-depth research, buried, which never appeared on the canvas, put off even his closest collaborators, like Kenneth Tyler, one of the most loyal who worked alongside him for more than 30 years. His canvases were very designed. They were not, they were not like abstract expressionism. You know, he didn't take a chance and just throw something down and think it was going to work or it did work, then he'd save it. If it didn't work, he'd paint over it. He plotted, he played with drawings and collages before he made his paintings so that by the time he started to paint, he knew exactly what he was doing. And he had an end goal that only he knew about. Um, you could watch him develop a series and you'd try to figure out where it was going. You couldn't. Um, Roy seemed to know that. Uh, he didn't tell you about it. Uh, it was one of his, his inner compasses that was at work. Laurie scrutinized and even celebrated this method of working. Indeed, she became a photographer. We see her in this self-portrait in the 90s. The pictures that she took are the best records of the particularly meticulous side of the painter. She took an inventory of everything, even Roy Lichtenstein's research. He kept it all to hand. I found this envelope that was just labeled explosions. And it was a list of, I think the word might be onomatopoeias, but sounds that you might find in a comic book of explosions like the sounds that machine guns would make or bombers or whatever, things like <laughs> and varoom and puck puck and blam. And I found an envelope that um, was just simply labeled women. And it was probably from the early 60s. So I was really amazed when I opened it up and I found the famous beach girl. During his last years, Roy Lichtenstein was creating very big formats. In photographing him painting them, Laurie produced unforgettable photos, herself creating true works of art which would be exhibited. Actually, these two photographs were done on the same day. You know, Roy just went on doing what he was doing, and I guess he was really happy at the point that these paintings had reached. They were nearly done. He was just um, fixing minor details. And they're not pose pictures. They're him actually doing what he was doing. And I actually read um, a transcript from a lecture that Roy gave a few years later. And he made some kind of joke about, well, you know, these paintings are so large. They look like you could walk into the room. But of course, you can't walk into the room. But then I thought, well, he kind of did, didn't he? <laughs> When I saw him again some years later, I was expecting to see someone who had changed. And I even thought, that's what will be the backbone of the film. I mean, we'll have him young, and then we'll have him after he's completely changed. There will be an effect. But not at all. I found the same man, older, sure, a bit of grizzled hair, and he was so thin, skinny, a little round head like that. He hadn't changed. I was disappointed. And it, uh, it, I'm essentially doing the same thing, but, but I think it's looked at differently uh, from the way it was then. I just, uh, but I, the only thing I've done is explore a lot of different things and a lot of... Uh, uh, feelings about other painters and other movements. The man who had always respected his own constraining syntax waited until the end of his career to free himself from it, to reinvent himself. 
with his later works, large bright canvases showing a fascination for sketching Chinese art, he broke through his own conventions. Finished with solid colour, the black outlines were gone and most noticeably, the framework of dots became more complex. A good ten or so different sizes of dots coexisted. The illustrative character of his pop paintings became completely blurred. It really shows you his dynamism. Here is a man in his 70s who is entirely inventing his work, who wrong foots his own style, who wrong foots his own subject, who will go entirely in a new direction. Because his large expanses of dots are almost abstract, are quite minimal, in a totally new style, which isn't at all his own. Because he was inspired by an oriental art which had nothing to do with his work from before, here he is inventing something else. And honestly, I wonder what he would have moved on to next. It's really very surprising for someone who has a career that is so well documented, so well recognized, to invent something else like that at his age. Abstraction finally took over in his last paintings. Roy Lichtenstein died in 1997 at the age of 74.